I got it. Okay, great. All right, here we go. <laughs> Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's second webinar in the series called Montana's Native People Perspectives on the Clovis Child, hosted by the Yellowstone Gateway Museum. My name is Diane Shelfont, and I'm a volunteer and board member of the Yellowstone Gateway Museum here in Livingston, Montana. The Clovis Child refers to the 12,600-year-old Anzac site in Park County, Montana the oldest known burial site in North America. Since it was first discovered in the 1960s, the site and the remains of the child buried there have been the focus of cultural and scientific study. This series is career oriented and it's directed toward college and high school students considering careers in the fields related to the speaker's work. We've asked our speakers to talk about their work, their various perspectives on the Clovis child, and their personal journeys toward their professions. In a moment, I'll introduce the museum's interim director, Karen Reinhardt, but first I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items so that you'll know how to participate in today's event. At any time during the webinar, you'll have the opportunity to submit your questions to today's presenter, Crystal Alegria. Your questions will be anonymous. To submit a question, just type the question in the Q&A at the bottom of the, um, of the control panel, and Karen and I will read the questions and share them with our speaker. As time allows, Crystal will address as many of the questions as she can during the Q&A session at the end of the presentation. We've also provided a chat box at the bottom as well, and the chat box is really for you to chat with other webinar participants or with us, with us, the hosts today. We've got many participants today and we want to be sure that we can track and answer the questions that you have. So again, please use the uh, question tab, the Q&A tab at the bottom, not the chat tab, tab if you have questions. Uh, we will be recording the webinar and we'll upload it to you. very short survey. We'll use the survey results to help us improve the series. I'd like to now introduce Yellowstone Gateway Museum's Interim Director, Karen Reinhardt. Thank you, Diane, for the introduction and for all of your hard work. We'd like to thank Humanities Montana for funding the series and the Montana Office of Public Instruction for additional support. I hope that our viewers were, will register for the remaining webinar programs, which are held every Tuesday, 1.30 p.m. through December 1st. Next, join us for anthropologist Samuel Stocky White's presentation, A Summary of the Anzic Site History. I'd now like to introduce Crystal Allegria. She is the director of the Extreme History Project, a nonprofit that makes history relevant. Crystal has worked in the field of public history and archaeological education for the last 20 years at a variety of museums and heritage organizations. She co-founded the Extreme History Project with colleague Marshall Fulton and has helped build the organization into an award-winning nonprofit that engages the public in history through walking tours, a lecture series, workshops, oral history, preservation projects, and other unique historical programming. Crystal serves on Bozeman's Historic Preservation Advisory Board and is a founding member of the Bozeman Historic Preservation Advocacy Group. She has written numerous articles and blogs on various topics relating to Montana history. Crystal has a BS in Anthropology and MA in History from Montana State University. Enjoy the presentation. Thank you, Karen. I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen now. And get that up and going here. Okay, well, thank you. Thanks so much, Karen and Diane and Yellowstone Gateway Museum for inviting me to be here today. And thank you to Humanities Montana for making this possible. They, it's so wonderful to have an organization like Humanities Montana that helps us all do this very important and significant work. So as Karen said, I'm the director of the Extreme History Project, which is a nonprofit that is located in Bozeman, Montana. 
we make history relevant. That is our mission. And we do that in a lot of different ways. We do that through walking tours. We do that through a lecture series. We do that through a book club. And most recently, we have a new podcast called The Dirt on the Past. So check that out. But we, all the things that we do, all the programming, we, our goal is to make history relevant. And so, um, for the presentation today, um, I'm going to talk a little bit about my career journey to getting to this place of being the director of the Extreme History Project and, um, and how I got interested in the fields of archaeology, anthropology, history, all those important fields, and so that all of you can get a sense of how to make that happen in your own lives if you would like to. I'm going to talk about also how my journey intertwines with that of the Anzac archeological site. So let's dive in. Okay. Like I said, director of the Extreme History Project. Here's a few pictures of, of the different things that we do. Like I said, bus tours, walking tours, a lot of placed-based history. So I grew up in Livingston, Montana, which is a small town that lays in the shadow of the Crazy Mountains and of the Absorki Mountains and is on the traditional land of the Absaliga or Crow people. As I was growing up in about fourth grade, I became fascinated with history and archeology, span both of which, of course, are ways to study our fascinating past. I loved everything old and ancient and I really became obsessed with Egyptology and more specifically with that, the, the, the uncovering of the tomb of Tutankhamun, King Tut. And that kind of plays into our story a little bit today. I would read every book in fourth grade that I could get my hands on that talked about King Tut's tomb. And so this is a photo of inside King Tut's tomb. And you'll see all the grave goods that are associated with this tomb that were found inside this tomb. And there's two, these two sentinels that you see um, standing guard besides the entrance to the burial chamber. So when I was in high school, I decided to go to college to study archaeology and wrote a letter to our local archaeologist in Livingston, Montana at that time, who was Dr. Larry Laren. And Dr. Larry Laren still lives in the Livingston area. So I wrote him a letter and I asked him, that question, how do I, if I want to be an archeologist, how do I do that? Where do I go to school? What do I study? All those sorts of things. And so Dr. Laren wrote me back, wrote me a letter back and he said, well, you should go into anthropology and you should go to the University of Montana because they have a really great anthropology program. And so I took his advice, but I didn't go into anthropology at U of M. I actually went to Montana State University, a little closer to home, I guess. And I did major in anthropology, which anthropology is the study of people in four different ways. So you see that kind of that umbrella of anthropology there. And under it, you see these four different ways to study anthropology. You can do it through archaeology, which is the study of people from the past through uh, culture and artifacts. Or you can study cultural anthropology, which is looking at how people live today, more in the present. You can study biological anthropology, which is kind of that CSI um, aspect, forensic anthropology, looking at crime scenes and those sorts of things, or linguistic anthropology. And linguistic anthropology is looking at languages and how languages developed over time, and that can tell you a lot about the history of our cultures. And I, what I do is I, I kind of, uh, during my study in my undergraduate degree in archeology, span I was really interested in that idea of applied archeology span or using archeology span to better understand people today and using that within um, our present um, paradigms. So I started my dream at Montana State University of becoming an archeologist and I was really lucky 
to land at MSU because it had a, a really small anthropology department at that time, and it still does. The anthropology department is still fairly small. And I was able to really get my hands dirty, so to speak. I, could re I really was able to dive in and do a lot of things as an undergraduate student that usually only graduate students get to do. So I got to go on a lot of archeological excavations throughout Montana. But the one I spent the most time at was um, a place called, what is now called First People's Buff Buffalo Jump near Great Falls, Montana. Back when I was doing archeology span there, they called it Om Pishkin, um, but the name has changed since then. And so I did a, about three or four summers of excavating along with my professors at Montana State University at Om Pishkin. And we, um, we were digging in an archeological site that was a buffalo jump. So it was very interesting and I got a lot of good experience doing that, but at the same time, um, during my classwork, during the school year, I was learning all about archaeology, I was learning all about anthropology, and in my first class, my first class at MSU, um, I think it was um, Anthropology 101, I learned about the Anzac site, this very important place called the Anzac site. Now, I had heard rumblings of the Anzac site um, prior in my life, but this was the first time I really learned exactly what it was. And it was, of course, a very significant site. So I was learning about it in this class. And of course, I wasn't learning about it in this class just because I was in Montana. Students in Anthropology 101 across the nation learn about this class. Across the world, um, this is a very significant site. And so it was interesting to me that I was learning about a site that was so significant that was located about 30 minutes from where I grew up. And so it, the significance of this site really hit me. And so if those of you in the audience um, didn't hear Shane Doyle's presentation um, last week, I'll just give you a brief synopsis of what uh, the ANZIC archeological site is. So um, in the 1960s, and D Diane, you mentioned a little bit of this at the beginning as well, but the, um, in the 1960s, there were two men near Wilson, Montana, that were excavating or kind of digging into the side of a hill um, with an excavator, a big mach machinery excavator. And as they were doing that, they all of a sudden um, heard kind of all these, this kind of tinkling, like all these stones kind of falling out of the side of this hill. And they thought, what the heck is that? So they stopped the machine and they got out and they went over and looked and it was all these artifacts that had kind of come spilling out of this embankment. And they uh, saw all these beautiful artifacts that you see here on this photograph. Uh, and they thought, oh my gosh, what is this? And, and all over these, red, these artifacts was red ochre, which is kind of a mineral hematite substance that had been ground up and spread over all these artifacts. And so they knew this was important. They knew this was um, something that should be looked at by an archeologist. So they called Dr. Larry Laren, who was the archeologist in the area at that time as well. And he came and looked at this and of course recognized it as also very significant. And so a lot of study of these artifacts were done. There was over a hundred of these artifacts along with some other um, bone that you can see there, bone implements. But along with these artifacts was skeletal remains. Skeletal remains of a small child that was about a, a year and a half old, a young child, a young boy child. And so that uh, really caused these artifacts to have a whole new meaning as well. There was a, also another um, individual, skeletal remains from another individual that was buried um, in the same area, um, but much more recently. And so um, still, still ancient remains, but not as ancient as this um, little boy. And the, the remains, the skeletal remains after the study was done and they had done a lot of analysis of these artifacts and the remains found that the boy dated, the boy's remains dated till about 12,600 years ago. So at that time, that was the oldest human remains that had been found in North America. So it was very significant and, and still is such a significant site.
So that gives you a little bit of information. And I know that um, Stocky White next week will give a lot more information probably on this site as well. And much more background information on this site. So, you know, this really ties in with my, my earlier um, fascination with the King Tut burial as well. And as I was thinking about this, when I was sitting in that Anthropology 101 class, I thought this is our King Tut burial. This is on the, the same level of that burial. These two are so similar in that way. And I, and I thought to myself, why does everyone know about King Tut, but no one knows about this little boy who was buried in what we now call Montana all those years ago. I also want to just talk really briefly about the name, the Anzic site. So the people that lived here in what we now call Montana 12,600 years ago didn't call themselves the Anzic people or the Clovis people. Um, the reason this archeolo archeological site is called the Anzic site is because the Anzic family owns the land where this site is located. Um, they owned the land in the 1960s and they still own the land today. And then, um, and so archeological sites are often named after landowners. So I just wanted to clarify that a little bit. We don't know what the people called themselves 12,600 years ago. It would be nice to know what they, what they called themselves. So as I was learning about this history and participating in archeology, span um, I received my undergraduate degree in anthropology and was glad to have that degree, but knew I had to go on for graduate work in order to get a job in this field because it's hard to get a job in anthropology with just an undergraduate degree. And so I decided to go on for my master's degree. And I was thinking about, well, should I go on to get my master's degree in anthropology? And as I was excavating over those summers in, in at the Buffalo Jump, at the Ulm Pishkin Buffalo Jump, I often felt like um, I was excavating someone's history that wasn't my own. And that bothered me a little bit. That, that always bothered me. And so that really played into my decision um, when I decided what to go on to do in my life and where to go to graduate school and what to go to graduate school for. And I thought about that idea of, of kind of excavating um, this history that wasn't my own. I'm, I have, I'm of Europe, European American descent and I was um, excavating sites of indigenous people. And so, so I thought about that a lot and I decided to, instead of going on to continue in anthropology, archeology, span I decided I would focus more on history and focus more on 19th century American history. So I really kind of, at that point, moved away from archeology. span not that I still don't do um, a lot of work with educating around archaeology, but I haven't done a lot of archaeology since then. And, and that's one of the main reasons. And that's why um, whenever I talk to students who are indigenous, I always talk about the need for indigenous archaeologists and the need for um, um, people who are um, native to this area to go into archaeology because of that feeling that I had of, of digging up history that wasn't my own. So I went into um, my graduate work also at Montana State, State University. Montana State University has a really good history department. So I thought, well, I'm here, I might as well just keep on going. And so I uh, continued on in the Montana State University history department. And I um, focused in on the history of, like I said, the 19th century West, and I wrote my master's um, thesis on the history of Fort Ellis, Montana. And Fort Ellis was a fort that was um, located just outside of Bozeman, Montana, about 10 miles outside of Bozeman, Montana. So after graduate school, took about three years, I guess, um, two or three years, I finished graduate school and then I had to look for a job. <laughs> And as I was finishing graduate school, my husband, um, my not yet husband, um, my to be husband and I were thinking about where we would find jobs. And he started, he was finishing his degree, his master's degree in chemistry about that same time. And so we decided to just um, look, you know, all over the nation for a job and 
you know, just see where we ended up. But we were young, we could do that. So um, Larry, my husband, started sending out resumes and he got a job in San Diego, California. And so we thought, well, that's, that sounds good to, to us. And so we moved to San Diego and I finished my master's degree. Or I was finishing writing my thesis in San Diego. And then I started looking for a job and I ended up landing at a Wells Fargo. And you think, huh, Wells Fargo, that's not really something you do with a degree in history, but um, you may not know that Wells Fargo has history museums all over the country. So Wells Fargo today is a bank, but they have a long history in the stagecoach business. So Wells Fargo owned a line of stagecoaches and they would deliver mail. Later they became a bank. So I became, um, I applied and became the curator and assistant curator at the Wells Fargo History Museum in Old Town, San Diego. And this was a great job. It was really fun. It was a, a small museum and we did a lot of school tours with students and we did a lot of interpretation to the public about Wells Fargo stagecoach history. And I was lucky enough that I also was able to um, work around the country in a lot of the Wells Fargo museums. And in San Francisco, they had an archives. And so I was able to go up there and work in the archives every once in a while. So it was a great job. And it was a great introduction to the world of museums. And I really got um, learned a lot about working in museums. And of course, you can go to school and um, learn so much in your undergraduate and graduate work, but when you really learn is when you're out doing the work. And so that's when I really learned a lot about history. I learned a lot about interpreting history at this point in my career. So Larry and I um, got married and had two children in San Diego. And as the kids were growing up, as our two kids, Emily and Lawson, were starting to grow up, we decided that, um, oh, I was really missing home. I was really missing the mountains of Montana. And I wanted to come home and, and I wanted to raise my kids in Montana as well. And so uh, I started looking for a job back at, here in Montana and found a job and was hired for a job in Bozeman working for an organization called Project Archaeology. So we moved back to Bozeman, and I drug Larry back to Bozeman, kicking and screaming, <laughs> but he's glad to be back now. Um, um, he, Larry is actually from California, so um, he's more of a warm weather guy, but, um, but he's, he loves the winter as well. So we came back to Bozeman, and I started working for Project Archaeology. And I'd always been thinking, throughout this whole time, kind of always learning more about the ANZIC site, archaeological site, reading the mo most current research, kind of keeping up with that archaeological site since it was so close to home. But when I started working for Project Archaeology, I knew that ANZIC site was going to come into play in a, in a bigger way because at Project Archaeology, what we did is we developed curriculum for kids using archaeological sites. And the first thing I thought about writing a curriculum about was the ANZIC site, because it was so important and just wanting more people to know about it and more students to know about it. So time went on and, and um, some more research started happening around the, the ANZIC archeological site. Uh, they were able to extract the DNA from those skeletal remains that I talked about from that little boy, that little um, child. And so there was all this research coming out about the DNA of the Anzac boy. And so uh, with that, I thought, oh, this is the perfect curriculum to write about the Anzac child is, is with this DNA research coming out. So um, Shane Doyle, who worked very, very closely um, and still does work very closely with Project Archaeology, um, and some of the Project Archaeology staff, we all together wrote this curriculum called Investigating the First Peoples, the Clovis Child Burial. And this, we partnered with the Office of Public Instruction to make this happen. So it's a great curriculum. It's, it's because of the DNA science, we um, decided the best audience for this curriculum would be grades eight through 12. So a little bit of a higher level audience than our normal 
third and fourth grade um, curriculums. But this curriculum is great and hopefully um, you have a look at it. Um, I know that a lot of professors at MSU use this curriculum in their colleges and hopefully some of the tribal colleges and I think some of the tribal colleges around the state also use this, this curriculum because it can, um, it can be used for eighth graders, but it can be used for adults as well. You can really ramp it up. So I just wanted to talk a little bit about what, the, what we focused on with this curriculum in writing it. Um, there was three enduring understandings, and what, what that means is just three points that we wanted to get across that people would learn and remember when they, when they studied the Anzac site. So the first one is that burial sites provide a human connection to the past and can reveal a lot about the culture of ancient people. So burial sites are often what archaeologists look to because oftentimes burials have grave goods buried with them. Um, you can get information from skeletal material from, from the um, remains themselves. But there's a lot of things with burials that can tell about the people who once lived on this land. The Clovis child burial from the Anzac site provides a human connection to the past and reveals how ancient people express their love. And I think, like I'll say again and again, that is what is one of the most important things about this curriculum. Um, studying ancient human remains has ethical implications. And so, of course, with this DNA research coming out, there was a lot of talk about the ethical aspects of this work. And there's still a lot of talk about it. Um, DNA has caused a lot of, um, of new research, but with that also comes ethics involved. So we really tackle that in the curriculum um, and talk about that. Um, archaeologists, um, so the, less, the, the first lesson really talks about archaeologists as scientists. So archaeologists are scientists that really bring a lot of different disciplines together to do their work. And so we wanted to talk about that because that aspect of the DNA science really comes into play into analyzing this culture and these objects that were left behind. Um, evidence found in study at burial sites can tell us something about how people mourned their dead. We can really see that with the Anzac archeological site. And archeological discoveries impact communities, nations, and the world. So with this Anzac site, this, that really impacted how, how, how we understood the past um, worldwide. Lesson two, we really talked about those ethical implications for people living today. And we talked about laws that protect um, American Indian burial sites in the, throughout our nation, but also in Montana. So we have laws, federal laws, and then we have Montana laws, and those, those two laws are very similar. And then, of course, people have different perspectives when it comes to studying ancient American Indian remains. And so we really talk about that in the curriculum, which I think is so important. And then the final performance of understanding is just that the Clovis Child burial provides a human connection to the past and reveals how ancient peoples and families express their love and their grief. So that's a little bit about um, the ANZIC curriculum and how um, that kind of came to, to be at Project Archaeology. And so um, about the same time, I started um, getting interested in another archaeological site that is much, much more recent. And this site was called Fort Parker. And it was the first Crow Indian agency that was located near present day Livingston. And it was located there before Livingston even existed. And its time frame, just to give you a sense of how much more recent this is, is 1869 to 1875. So a much more recent archaeological site. And so started getting interested, not as much in the archaeology, but more in the history of this place. And so um, my colleague Shane Doyle and colleague Marcia Fulton, the three of us kind of started getting interested in this place and started doing research on it, documentary research on the history of the First Crow Indian Agency, and are still doing um, research and interested in this place. But um, 
within that, within that research and, and talking about history and talking about important history, we kind of started forming another organization. And that organization that we started to think about and form at that time is called the Extreme History Project. And the reason that we formed this organization is because we wanted to talk about those histories that were not as much known. We wanted to talk about history that um, no one knew about. We wanted to talk about why no one knows about some of this history. And so we started an organization to do that, the Extreme History Project. So over time, um, Extreme History grew and grew. Um, we, we got our nonprofit status in 2012, and it just kept growing and growing. And so um, about two years ago, I um, quit my job at Project Archaeology, and I became the full-time director at the Extreme History Project. And so that's kind of my journey from, uh, from fourth grade to now. <laughs> and as you'll notice, there's kind of a theme that goes through this, this work and this work that I do, and it's the history of place. So for me, place is really important. And going out to a place and learning the history while you're standing on that place is such a um, is such a good way to learn history because you can see, you can hear the place, you can touch mm. the place, you can smell the place. And so it's just a really good way of learning history. And that's why at Extreme History Project, we do a lot of that learning on the ground where history happened. We that's why we we do bus tours. We take people out to these places. Um, here's a, a good example we did a bus tour last summer where we took people out to Fort Parker, that first Crow Indian agency, um, to learn about that place there mm -hmm. at the place. And so, um, but we also do historic walking tours here in Bozeman. And, um, and I know that a lot of places throughout the country do walking tours and they're becoming more and more popular. And I think that's because people like that way of learning history is to be listening to what happened as you're looking at the building, we're looking at the, the ground where this history actually um, happened. So to me, um, history of place is really important and community history is, is very significant. And so that's kind of um, where I ended up and that's kind of how I got there. But let's come back to the Anzic child one more time and kind of speak about that and talk about what does this child teach us? What does this Anzic archaeological site with the remains of, of these um, two people, one a child, what, what can that tell us today? Because of course we think about history, but the reason history is important is because we want to implement that in our own lives today. And so what does this child teach us? And to me, this child teaches us a lot about family and community really teaches us the importance of love, loving one another, and supporting each other in this community. And so I think this illustration here by Eric Carlson really shows that as well, and shows that importance of family, and shows that um, this little boy was buried with all these artifacts, hundred more than a hundred artifacts. And if you think about the um, the significance of, of all the work that went into those artifacts. Just think how much love was poured into that little boy, boy's burial. So to me, that's kind of the most important part of this is love and the importance of family. So that's about all I've got for you today as we kind of uh, talked about the, the ANZIC site and and my journey, and, and, and I just want to reiterate again the importance of um, people going into history and learn and, and going into this field of history and archaeology and anthropology. It's very significant, and you can get a job in it. <laughs> That's the most important part. You can actually make a living doing this. Um, I do, and many of my colleagues do. So, so I. I think that's a misnomer that you hear is that um, you can't get a job in archaeology or history, but I'm living proof you can. <laughs> Thank you so much, Crystal. Great presentation. Um, 
I, I'd like to invite everyone um, who has a question to go ahead and, and um, submit questions in the Q&A uh, tab at the bottom. Um, and, and Crystal, I thought that your, your work, not only with the ANZIC site, but Fort Parker and First People's Buffalo Jump was just really fascinating and um, um, neat to hear about the variety that a person can do both as a historian and as an archaeologist. Okay, questions. I have a couple of questions while others are composing theirs. Um, first, uh, what do you find most rewarding about your work as a historian? You know, in other words, why do you do what you do? <laughs> um, that's a good question. And, um, you know, I think the importance of history, everything revolves around history. Everything that we do on a daily basis revolves around history. And we probably don't see it that way, but it really does. Um, all of our um, all of our learning has a historical component. All of our politics has history to it. Um, all of everything that we do, um, traditions has history to it. So, I think that to me, history is such an important part of our everyday lives, and it's good to know that history. Um, it's good to know where. Um, where you come from. It's good to know the history of your place that you live in, of your community. And so, you know, I love my job because I think people, there's, everyone um, has an appreciation, maybe not, um, you know, everyone eventually has an appreciation for history. I'll just say that, <laughs> usually. And so I love to see um, people engage with history and get excited about it and learn about it and especially students but everybody but everybody it's so fun to see people come on walking tours and learn about the place where they've lived for 20 years and didn't know about this one particular thing and get really excited about that so so to me that is important but it's also important to know who was here before us um, to think about the people who created this place who lived here um, think about how long people have lived here. People have been living in this place for at least 12,600 years ago. I'm sure probably much, you know, longer than that. Um, and so to think about those people who lived here and, um, and the values that they held as well for this land. Thank you. Um, great answer, I would confer. Um, I also wondered what you would recommend to students who are interested in history, but they're not sure exactly which, you know, how to approach it or what to study specifically, what branch to go into in anthropology or, um, yeah, any advice that you might give them just to help them in their journey for figuring yeah. out their career. Yeah, I would say when you go into, when you go to school, when you go to um, university, take a few different classes, take a history class, take an anthropology class, um, because they're very different. Um, archaeology, anthropology is more um, based in the sciences and history, of course, is more based in the humanities. So you learn in very different ways with those two disciplines. And I think that, um, you know, by taking different classes in each one, you get a better sense of which, where you'll fall, where, where you would enjoy working the most. But I also encourage you to go work in a, um, volunteer in a museum, volunteer for um, a uh, local historical society, uh, check out your local genealogical club, and kind of engage in some of those other aspects of public history history that isn't as an academic, but more public history, and see what, what interests you, where you fall. Maybe actually um, volunteer to go on an archaeological excavation if you have the oppor opportunity to do that, and um, also join the Montana Archaeological Society if you're interested in archaeology or history, um, because they have an annual meeting that you can go to and hear information about what is happening 
in the last year archaeologically around the state. You can also join the Montana Historical Society. Uh, that's our state historical society, and they do a conference once a year. You can attend that, and you can hear about what people are researching, what the latest um, you know, research trends are in history, and just see which one interests you the most. And uh, there's a lot of opportunity within that, and I think that uh, students don't take a, enough advantage of those those um, very inexpensive um, options as well. And that's a great way to network and start talking to pe people who actually work in the field of archaeology. And, you know, like I did with Dr. Laren, um, it's much easier now. You don't have to write a letter anymore. You can, <laughs> you can just send an email and talk to, talk to those people and see what they do on a daily basis, because that, of course, is going to tell you, or, or, am I going to like this or am I not going to like this? One other thing with me about archaeology is that after doing archaeology in the field for a few years, I realized, oh, if I become an archaeologist, I'm going to have to work out in the field all summer long for my career. And I wasn't, I didn't know if I was too excited about that. And so um, that's another reason I kind of moved away from archaeology. But you might want to talk to an archaeologist and say, you know, what does your daily existence look like? What do you do on a daily basis? Mm -hmm. And because not archeo all archaeologists work in the field, you know, all summer long. Um, so, so I think that that's a good way. Just start talking to people about it too. Great. So we have another question um, that's related to archaeology, and and the question is: Tell us more about these early people, their rituals, where they may have come from. Did they migrate seasonally? What did the villages look like? And do you know things from such an early site? Those kinds of things. Wow, that's a big question. <laughs> but a very good question. And um, there, there is um, a great book to read about kind of this area archeologically called 600 Generations. And it's written by Carl Davis. And he explains a lot of that in that book. Um, you know, archaeologically, we have the earliest evidence we have of people here in this part of the world in Montana. Um, what we now call Montana is the Anzac site. And so, but we know very little about these people because the evidence is so scarce. And so this, this burial was really important because it showed us um, you know, it didn't show us a whole lot, but it did show us what kind of stone tools people were using. It showed us some a little bit, like I talked about, um, the importance of the family, the importance of this child. Um, so, you know, we don't know a whole lot about these early people. Um, and it's, it would be wonderful to know more. And so, um, but we're always learning. Every day we're learning more about um, people who lived here. Um, you know, we, of course, we know much more about how people lived in this area more recently. And that's through a lot of different sources. That's through archaeology, but that's also through oral history, of course. And um, there's such an, we have such um, good oral history records here, or oral history tradition here within our Montana tribes. And so that's um, something to look at as well. So I talked today about archaeological evidence, which is kind of that, um, those artifacts in the ground, documentary evidence from more recent history, you know, records and, and um, you know, diaries and census records and marriage certificates and those sorts of things that you can glean information from. But there's also the oral tradition, and that's so important when doing um, research going back prior to um, the 1860s is that oral tradition. So that's hugely significant. And so there's a lot of um, tribal histories that have been written as well that talk about, of course, because I can't just say, well, this, you know, across the board, this is how the cultures, um, this is how people lived and this is what their units look like because um, everyone lives a little bit different. Every tribal nation lived a little bit differently. So. Um, I suggest there's um, tribal histories, and they should be in every uh, library in the state of Montana. So should, there should be those tribal histories in a library close to 
um, everyone. And then also on the um, Office of Public Instruction, the Indian Education for All website, they will have direction on how to get a hold of those um, tribal histories as well. So I kind of avoided the question to a certain degree, but, <laughs> but there's some information to send you out to learn more about it. That's great, Crystal. And you know, I and I appreciate you kind of alluded to something that you'd mentioned uh, off line, I guess, earlier about the idea of hard history too, and maybe history from very, from perspectives that we don't hear as much. So the oral histories, I would think, would be really helpful. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we have a tendency to not want to talk about some aspects of history, but it's important to talk about all aspects of history because it validates that history. Right. Kind of thinking about that hard history. It's important to talk about the hard history, um, the history that isn't pretty, because that validates and makes sure that people know that that in history is just as important as any other aspect of history. I have a question from the chat box. What advice would you give to record and preserve the oral histories? Uh, record and preserve them. Yeah, so you, you know, um, record them and that can be as easy as taking out your phone and hitting record and recording someone talking about um, what they know about their growing up, about their grandmothers and grandfathers and their lives. Um, you know, it can just be as easy as that. And of course, it can get much more complicated if you do an, a formal oral history project, but it doesn't have to be either. It can just be as easy as, as recording that information and then transcribing it, which just means kind of writing it all out uh, in a document and then submitting it to the local museum or just to keep it within your family and just keep that oral, um, that oral history recorded. And you know, the preserving part, if you do give it to a local um, historical society or museum, they will keep it in perpetuity. So that's a way to preserve it. Um, but you could preserve it within your family as well. I just wanted, thank you. Crystal, I just wanted to also mention that Jennifer Statham uh, with OPI has included a couple of links. Oh, good. Yes. There's a link to the curriculum that you developed with Project Archaeology. And then she just included a link to a resource on Montana tribal histories. So for those Perfect. who are listening, you can click on those links and then explore that later. Thanks, Jennifer. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, you can just, if you, and I encourage everyone to look at that curriculum on the um, ANZIC child because it is important and it's easily accessible. You can just Google it. Um, just Google um, investigating first peoples, the Clovis child, and you'll find it. And it's on the Indian Education for All website too. Well, it looks like we don't have any more questions at this point, Crystal, so I'd like to thank you and turn it back over to Karen. All right, thanks, Diane. Okay, so I just wanted to thank you and to thank uh, not only Crystal, but all of our viewers this afternoon. Remember that next Tuesday, 1.30 p.m., you can join us for anthropologist Samuel Stocky White's presentation, a summary of the Anzic site history. And please consider subscribing to the Yellowstone Gateway Museum's YouTube channel, where each of these live webinars will be uploaded, um, usually within 24 hours of the event. So we hope to see you next week and really appreciate you tuning in. So take good care until then. Bye, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Bye. -bye. <laughs>